we welcome you all um, for the webinar, which is uh, going to be presented by Dr. Prashad Kaipa um, on managing the stress. Uh, as you have uh, indicated, that uh, topic is mainly going to be about uh, managing the stress, fear, and anxiety during these uh, trying times. Um, we have we are fortunate to have uh, Dr. Kaipa to come and talk to us about uh, this important topic at this trying time. And Dr. Kaipa has been not uh, a stranger to the Knockout Foundation and uh, our efforts. He's the CEO of uh, the Kaipa Group in California, and uh, he is uh, frequently, you know, called to the uh, management trainings and other conferences and retreats, and he has authored uh, several books. Um, he works with the companies and senior executives and uh, in the Silicon Valley with the areas of innovation, leadership, development, coaching. He has also been an in, uh, visiting professor of Indian School of Business and uh, founding executive director of uh, Center for Leadership Innovation and Change. Uh, he has also founded uh, Entrepreneur Institute for TIE in the Silicon Valley. Uh, he has his PhD from uh, uh, University of, and a professor at University of Utah, and he has worked uh, in in that area. And then his uh, award-winning city rounds for leadership based on his uh, lead learning interface concepts and pyramid building methodology has been used by uh, many other uh, management institutes. And uh, <laughs> he's, he's uh, been a prolific author, leader, coach, advisor, and researcher. And uh, he has been um, tuned to the community and he would like to share his views on uh, uh, how to deal with the stress. It's again a privilege and an honor to talk to North South Foundation uh, family um, because for the past few years that I have been associated with, I have uh, generated enormous amount of respect and uh, love for what you do, how you do, and how you have been able to manage for past 30 years. Uh, remarkable capability to contribute not only to uh, Indian American kids in the United States, but also through scholarships and uh, through various programs back to children in India. And my kudos to you. So today, as we talk about uh, the managing stress in these uh, difficult times, I thought I will first show you what I'm presenting. So because there are so many definitions of stress and so many ways in which people can interpret, I want to start with the medical definition of stress first, and then I'll give right away various resources that I have used to develop this particular webinar. And you can uh, go back to these resources list. Most of them are hyperlinked so that you can go to the videos, you can go to the workbooks, you can go to exercises and uh, variety of them. I will provide that so that you can learn further. Then we will look at what are the kinds of signals that the stress shows up. How does it affect us? And how do we know that we are actually going through major stress? And then uh, I'll try to divide it up into areas where it will show up and how do we address the stress? I will use methodologies that have been used in uh, either Stanford University uh, Psychology Center or uh, Cleveland Clinic or uh, Yoga Bharati, and so some of the material I have brought in from around the world, integrating both the Western as well as the Eastern approaches, medical, psychological, as well as philosophical approaches. I'll give you some exercises. That's why I have requested each of you to bring some papers as well as some color pens. And the reason why I ask you to do color pens is to differentiate when you are writing down um, whatever is useful to you 
in dealing with your stress management questions use one color if it is a broad informational stuff that is something that makes you curious and insightful write it with another color so that you can differentiate what are actionable and insightful and something that you can immediately apply from some things that are informational and some things that uh, makes you curious but that may not be immediately applicable plus there will be a vision exercise if you can do that when you are watching some of the videos that i will be showing you may get some specific questions so you can write answers to it and you can do exercises that's why we are going to do this webinar not just as a one way conversation i would like it to be interactive to the extent uh, it is possible with uh, you know 100 plus uh, participants so that's the reason why we want you to write questions in the place where they see ask you to write so that we can prioritize and address as many questions as possible and finally i'll try to summarize a couple of things and i'll take uh, further questions which will come up um, in the end that's the plan for the day so here are the resources which i took as you can see from kaiser permanente cleveland clinic psychology today heart math institute this heart math institute is a pioneering research institute which has got even bio um, technology tools like you can actually bio feedback tools that have been used in army that have been used in schools that have been used in large number of uh, organizations they have some very powerful tools and methodologies and for limited time they have given access to the heart math experience so that's a link that you can go and you can go through the training for stress management as well plus um, from stanford university we will do some exercises in addition to that i have also given some things like a simha kriya sadguru jaggi vasudev has been proposing recently especially he has uh, proposed it for dealing with the stress related to coronavirus which are very nice new kind of uh, pranayama exercises and there is a you know world but gold uh, talk by kelly meganagal on how to make stress your friend it has been viewed by millions of people and i have found it to be extremely useful ted video i highly recommend you to watch it <clears throat> and in addition to that there is an organization called yoga bharati in united states which is associated with the vivekananda yoga university in bangalore <clears throat> they have made several videos and they have created uh, nadi suddhi pranayama different kinds of uh, yoga that you can do like a chair yoga other kinds of yoga that you can do while you are staying at home while you are in shelter in place or lockdown whatever you want to call so that on a daily basis you can reduce the stress in addition to that if there are any references that i have used i have referred to them in the slide itself so let's begin with all of us getting a shared understanding of what stress is i know there are doctors uh, like balu and there are many other physicians in the audience so, so i also know there are parents and students and there are psychologists so for us all to agree for this particular webinar i'm using this definition stress is the body reaction to any change that requires an adjustment or response what is interesting is that body reacts to these changes differently at in a body sensation level in breath level in emotional mental level it all actually acts in different ways we will talk about that a uh, little bit later but what is most important to recognize is stress is not a new phenomena because of the coronavirus this is actually a everyday part of life and in fact without stress we will not be able to perform at our best and as we go through the webinar we will actually do exercises which will show you that some of your highest productivity and creativity might have come from stress we will also talk about how stress can be used stress that means you know how to deal with the stress in a positive way that will convert your 
the hormones that have been generated in the body in a positive sense as well as if you are unable to manage this and if it becomes a overwhelm sometimes you can get into a distress situation so it is the question of not about not having stress but it is about this webinar will focus on how to manage the stress in such a way you can your stress response will give you much more productive meaningful life that you can lead so what are some of the strength uh, signs of stress and how do they affect us so according to medical profession here are various things that they have uh, identified like if you get a stomach pain if you get butterflies in the stomach if you get migraine headaches or if you begin to uh, you know have some indigestion or difficulty in digesting your food or lack of appetite any of these things any stresses will show up in the body either as sweaty palms or you just don't have energy you are completely tired or you might even start shaking you know over a period of time you might lose a lot of weight because of stress on the other hand for some other people you might gain a lot of weight already i have been hearing from some other people being in this kind of a lockdown in the home people are saying i gained 2 uh, 3 pounds and some people are saying i have actually lost some pounds and i might have some difficulties not only in the family room and in the bedroom also you might have difficulties so the key part which we need to recognize is the chronic stress can wear down the defenses and reduce the immunity and that might make you susceptible to um, you know other kinds of problems like uh, right now i hope you are all going out when you do have to go out with mask and with appropriate care and if your immunity is down and when you go out uh, you can pick up issues from outside and they can lead to much bigger problems than what is necessary so the key thing which i want you to first uh, make this question personal to you what do i mean by that if you are experiencing any of these symptoms at this moment for yourself make a note on a sheet of paper that you have in front of you what are the specific symptoms that you frequently have it is extremely important for you to identify how to recognize when you are stressed out is it that you sweat a lot is it that you have sweaty palms is it that you get headaches is it that you have muscle, you know like a neck pain or a headache stomach ache anything else you need to know what are your specific symptoms please take a minute and write down what are the ways in which you know that you can you are stressed so that the awareness becomes higher and of course once you write that you can also write down how do you recognize in your family whether it is your children whether it is your parents whether it is your spouse how do you whether it is your siblings how do you know that uh, they are stressful right now it is not time to push them or make jokes about their stress or it is about uh, kind of pushing them to the wall so that the explosion or a negative conversations or negative situations you can avoid please write down your symptoms and the symptoms that other people in your family respond i'll stop for a minute and if you have multiple symptoms just make a note of it and if there are any questions that come up make a note we will address your questions in a little bit again as i mentioned um, if you really look at stress it can actually help you or it can hurt you like sometimes people say the stress hormone one of the, of course you have cortisol and some of them will talk in uh, detail uh, there are some things which are actually called stress hormones can also be very helpful for your heart health 
and they are also called cuddle hormones like oxytocin is one of the hormones that is uh, affected by stress but even when people hug you people touch you uh, you know when uh, people kind of uh, put their arms around you and if you feel the empathy and affection from them uh, the same hormones actually generate so in some respects it is the mindset or the attitude with which you approach the stress actually makes you distressed or productive so at some level you know the research shows that it is not the stress that uh, kills people but people who believe that the stress is bad for them the one they get affected and that is the research study that has been recently quoted just you know about a week ago uh, in uh, new york uh, times so the key part of stress management if i were to summarize the entire webinar for you is you need to rethink stress you need to actually begin to look at stress not as your enemy but as your friend of course some of you might already think oh this is going to be a positive pollyanna this is just about positive thinking i can't deal with uh, all the stress that my manager is creating my family is creating my friends are creating you need to recognize that 10% of what you are experiencing because of stress is based on external circumstances or other people creating those kinds of situations 90% of stress response that you are going through either in your body or in your mind is actually how you are reacting to that stress and how you are taking that so to a certain extent while it might look like a positive pollyanna i will show you through the science through the research that has been done in this webinar that actually being curious and learning to work with stress recognizing that i am stressed how can i use this stress what can i do when i am stressful could be a very powerful reframing that will be useful to you so let me take you to a video that uh, stanford university has developed and i will give you the uh, link to this you will be able to go and actually um, go through the entire workbook and some of them but for the time being let's just look at uh, this particular video an introductory video that they have which is about what the stress is and how do they look at it since the 1970s a deluge of academic studies and media attention has inundated us with the message that stress is bad for you stress has been cited as a growing plague and an epidemic the american psychological association told us stress is linked with the six leading causes of death the World Health Organization states, stress is America's number one health problem. An entire stress management industry was created to teach us how to minimize stress or try to avoid it entirely. But there is equally strong scientific data that shows stress can enhance your performance and productivity. It increases your brain processing speed, improves your memory, and focuses your attention. Stress can also improve your health and vitality by allowing a quicker recovery from injury, enhanced immunity, and physiological toughening. Stress and challenge can facilitate your learning and psychological growth by increasing your mental toughness, creating deeper relationships, and providing a greater appreciation for life. So how can we reconcile this conflict? How can stress be debilitating to some people and enhancing to others? In 2009, Ali Crum from Yale and Sean Aker from Harvard conducted a study to test a new hypothesis. They wanted to evaluate how much the effects of stress were determined by a person's mindset towards stress. They designed a study to determine if training a group of stressed employees about the positive benefits of stress could reduce the detrimental effects of stress and increase the beneficial ones. 
The answer is yes. The study showed that the group who received the stress is enhancing training was able to significantly reduce stress-related health symptoms, such as headaches, backaches, insomnia, and hypertension, and significantly increased their productivity and work performance. This online program includes all the essential elements of that training taught by the creators of that study. This will enable you to take the stress you have in your life and turn it into something that is enhancing to your performance, physical health, and psychological growth. So, uh, the, we will actually, I talk about some of this and we will go into uh, the stress and how it is helpful and how it is hurtful. We'll dig into it. So, one of the things which I remember while I was talking about this was a study that was done recently uh, by, I think, a Seattle-based research institute there were two people one mother uh, and a 80 year old daughter who was going through leukemia and uh, she was going through interferon treatment and uh, um, the uh, what you call lymphocytes if i remember right are the things that were affected and this girl wanted to go for uh, Chris, uh, for the christmas time vacation to disneyland in los angeles area the mother didn't have the money but the make a wish foundation granted them um, certain three to four days of uh, being in uh, disneyland for the mother and the daughter so as they were prepared to go because the immunity will be affected by being exposed to so many people in the disneyland uh, the doctors essentially checked the immunity like a white blood cell count for uh, both the mother and daughter mother for mostly a baseline and a comparison and so they did the study they did the um, tests on wbc before they went and then the mother and daughter went to disneyland and they had a lot of fun time in uh, disneyland and when they came back after a week uh, the tests were again done and the doctors called both mother and daughter back into the, um, um, what you might call a, a clinic. And then they checked with the mother, especially a lot more questions were asked about the mother, about how she felt and how was the experience for her. The mother got irritated and basically said, wait a minute, why are you asking me about my health? She is the one who was exposed to so many people and you know she might have picked up something she they said don't worry about your daughter because your daughter's health and immunity shows and her white blood cell count when we measured it is as if she went through two more treatments of whatever uh, you know uh, what you call interferon treatment whatever treatment we are giving as if she received two treatment double the dose uh, that is how she is she is very good but we are concerned about you the mother was completely puzzled. Number one, I don't have leukemia. Number two, I don't have immunity problem. But what I what is your problem? What are you asking me? They said, before you left, you didn't have an immunity problem. But after you came back from Disneyland, you, you are behaving as if your immunity has dropped a lot, as if it is like you are very, you know, susceptible for uh, even somebody sneezing in the room, you could get a flu kind of a situation. We wanted to know what happened. And through the conversation, they found out actually the mother did not like the adventure rides at all. She didn't mind the basic Ferris wheel, but various rides, the kid, 80 year old kid had so much of fun going again and again. The mother was petrified. So both of them were screaming, except that the mother was screaming with terror, daughter was screaming with joy. And interestingly, they were sitting through, sitting next to each other and went through every experience in Disneyland. And that experience boosted the daughter's immunity so much 
on the other on the, at the same time uh, the mother's immunity has gone down a lot so the lesson i got out of this experience uh, which was stated in one of the magazines was that stress is not necessarily what happens to you but stress is what you interpret out of it so i thought you should actually look at a few more things about stress and what does the latest science say about the stress before we actually do something so after this i'm going to ask you to look at two questions and do exercise so if you don't mind be ready with the paper and then as you are watching the video please make notes on what are some of the things that affect your stress directly at the same time what are some curious things that they are saying that you want to learn more about or read more about with a different color pen okay here we go again signs of stress So what's the science behind the idea that stress is more valuable than we think? What proof do we have that stress can enhance both our performance and our health and enable psychological growth? First, a trip back in time. Stress, if you think about it, is designed to help us. When a saber-toothed tiger attacked us in prehistoric times, neurochemicals dropped into our body to prepare us to either fight off the tiger or to run away. This increased our chances for survival and our ability to pass on our genes to the next generation. And this positive aspect of stress is still valuable to us today, even if you don't work with saber-toothed tigers. Moderate levels of stress get you moving towards your goals and help you marshal the resources to get something done. As stress increases, your performance continues to increase, at least up to a point. We see this in top athletes preparing for competition, neurosurgeons, going into the operating room and performers going on stage. Their stress primes them to be at their best. We call this use stress, but this response is nonspecific. Your body and most parts of your brain can't tell the difference between lethal threats such as a saber-toothed tiger that may attack and non-lethal threats such as a long list of urgent tasks, an upset boss or a red down arrow on a stock ticker. We all know what it is like when our stress is no longer helpful. Like when you realize you won't have the time you needed to get all the work done, or you don't have the skill to take a project to completion. When that happens, your performance decreases. You might feel paralyzed or lose the perspective necessary for good decisions, which causes more stress, which leads to a further reduction in your ability to get things done. We call this downward spiral distress. Preventing and or managing this distress has become a billion dollar industry. But traditional stress management programs suffer from two fundamental flawed assumptions. First, they assume that the effects of stress are only negative, that stress can only lead to deterioration in performance. Second, they assume that the only way we can fix this problem is to reduce, manage, or fight against the stress we feel in order to maximize how much stress we can handle before crashing into distress. But stress itself is a fight or flight response to perceived threats. These programs remind us how bad stress is for us. So when the inevitable stress incident occurs, we get stressed about feeling stressed. We think, I'm not supposed to feel this. This is bad for me, which multiplies the negative effects. These programs also set up stress as something to fight against. They teach us to resist or control our response to the stress we feel. This reinforces the fight or flight response and effectively opens another front in our war on stress. These trainings miss the fact that stress is not an enemy to be avoided, but can actually be a useful ally in reaching our goals. So what is the stress response actually designed to do? Is it an outdated system that no longer has much use to us? The research tells us no, that in fact, the same benefits that helped us in prehistoric times can be crucial to thriving in the midst of the chaos of your modern life. Let's review the research into the benefits of stress. We hear a lot about how stress can decrease your cognitive performance, but there is scientific research that the opposite is true as well. 
For example, in a particularly X Games generation study, scientists found that the subjects in the midst of a bungee jump can process information much faster than a non-free-falling control group. Subjects memory and performance on standard cognitive tests actually increase when they are told to put their hands into ice water, a rather stressful activity. Other studies show benefits to your immune system when under stress. When a group of patients was purposely stressed before going into knee surgery, they recovered at twice the rate of a control group not primed with stress. This makes sense from a historical perspective. If you get attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, that's the time you want your immune system working at its optimal level. If you get hit by the tiger, you want your immune system to respond very quickly. This is how vaccines work as well. They stress your body with an overload of antigens to create an active immune response. It's also how we get stronger. Weightlifting stresses our muscles to the point where we break some muscle fibers. As they heal, they rebuild stronger than they were before. And some of our most stressful life events, such as battling cancer, being in an accident, or going to war, can cause huge leaps in personal growth. While post-traumatic stress is a real phenomenon, there's a huge body of research showing many people come through these challenges having grown not despite the trauma, but because of it. They feel more connected with family, friends and society at large. They find increased levels of resilience and a greater appreciation for life. Scientists call this phenomenon post-traumatic growth. By changing our mindset about stress, we can significantly change our own stress response curve. Learn the tools provided in this program and you can train yourself to utilize your stress to find new higher levels of performance, health, and well-being. I hope you are beginning to get some reframing effect of what stress does and what can we do to manage the stress. At this moment, you might want to take a minute to think about in your own life, think about a time when you performed at your highest level or experienced significant personal growth or development. Second question you might also want to think about is, in those times, what actually fueled you to perform at the highest level? Who or what motivated you to improve and grow? Can you think of a time in your life? And can you please take a couple of minutes and write that down? When were you at your best performance? Please. It's extremely meaningful in webinars like this to personalize and identify what you are getting in your situation instead of looking at it intellectually, this is stimulating. So apply it, use it as if it is a workshop that is happening face to face. That's the reason why I'm asking you to write this down. And after that, if you have any questions, and if you have any comments, please start uh, putting it in the chat box or questions box so that uh, we will get some kind of a way to do that. And by the way, if any one of you had an insight or you recognize something, what happened, and if you want to share it, please let us know. And uh, we are willing to take maximum two inputs and you know some comments from you. So please uh, let us know that uh, you have something you want to share or you have some insight that you had you want to tell us. Please let us know as well. All right, let's go to the next part. If you have thought about when you were at your highest uh, performance, when you were at your best, obviously the external circumstance might have created a large amount of stress for you at that moment. But if you really reflect on it right now, 
you know you feel like that became a turning point i can think about when uh, i was laid off uh, from apple and you know that was very very stressful one day i am a fellow and i am actually considered to be one of the people who were contributing like one of the four or five people in apple who were given total freedom to do whatever i want and i had millions of dollars at uh, my disposal and next day because uh, there were some major changes uh, in 1990 i was told that my job as a research fellow is no longer open and i needed to find either something else as a more productive manager or you know i have certain amount of time before i leave apple that was extraordinarily stressful time for me i went to yosemite because it's only like about 4 hours drive from me and uh, during thanksgiving time in 1989 i stayed for about 3 days meditated and uh, i first two days my problem was why me how come on one day they say i have done so much for apple and they say i am so valuable to apple and i am reporting to the highest levels of the organization and next day they tell me they can't pay me my salary and they can't keep me as a fellow i need to do some more meaningful job as they call it that was really really stressful for me but one thing that uh, i got out of three days of uh, my self reflection and meditation was this is something that i can use to continue my research because as i was being told to let go before that for one year i was given an opportunity to go around the world interview like 17 nobel laureates meet with about 200 extraordinary people around the world look at how people think how people learn how people create you know this is the research that i was doing i had a chance to be in operating theaters of brain surgeons and i had chance to go around the world and learn a lot about how people learn how people think and how people create so once it became like an opportunity instead of going back to logistical and operational or go back to marketing in apple some other division if i actually continue to do research on what made you know me to learn and what made me curious what made me excited during those times of uh, 1989 that would be excellent so i chose to quit apple instead of finding another job and start a research institute on you know uh, institute for learning and knowledge architecture and that's what fed my past 30 years now i feel like my boss has done the greatest favor to me in 1989 by laying me off from apple because that was the impetus for me to do all the research that i have done all the books that i have done i moved away from being a physicist and a computer scientist to actually becoming uh, yes to a certain extent a psychologist and a, a ceo whisperer if you want to call a ceo coach and uh, work on the human development aspects of it instead of just the technology so similarly i found out that changing my mind about how i feel about the situation not that they gave me back the job or not that uh, you know i got job somewhere else but it is the freedom that i had and the choice that i made and the happiness that i experience now i can create my own future i can create my own research institute and i can be a consultant interestingly by the way in past 30 years i never went back and took a full time job even though i taught in uh, you know indian in school of business i was the executive director i was doing it part time i was doing it from wherever i am so truly that was a major freeing experience so in this video what you will see is how you look at stress in your own life and how 
you can change your mindset and that can free up something significantly different so please get your papers and pens take a new sheet of paper because you are going to look at some uh, some more information and you might want to write down some notes that will come out of that all right so video again <clears throat> It's a 10 minute video. Again, uh, please uh, write, use different colors to look for what you can immediately apply versus what you are curious and you want to learn about. At any given moment, the amount of potential information to take in is unwieldy. Therefore, we need a simplifying system, a lens or frame through which to view and make sense of the world. This lens is what we call a mindset. What we have found in the research is that the mindsets we choose play a powerful role in determining our physiology, our behavior, and the way in which the world shows up around us. So let's take a look at the placebo effect. We traditionally view the placebo effect as a way to test the effectiveness of a medication against an inactive substance or inert dummy pill. But what the placebo effect really is, is an incredible and consistent demonstration of the power of the mindset to recruit healing properties in the body, even in the absence of any pharmaceutical or chemical substance. A review of clinical trials suggests that 60 to 90% of all diseases benefit from a placebo effect. This includes a range of diseases from anxiety and depression to osteoarthritis, hypertension, and even cancer. Intensive research in the last 10 years supports the fact that placebo effects can trigger complex neurobiological phenomena, including the activation of distinct brain areas, as well as peripheral physiology and the immune system. Hidden design studies have allowed researchers to further examine the power of mindset and healing. These studies confirm that a patient's mindset about the medications they are taking are important. For example, patients who are given morphine through an IV under the impression that the IV is simply a saline solution do not experience the same pain relief as those who are told they are receiving morphine. The placebo effect extends beyond the dummy pill. For example, fake poison ivy has shown to generate real rashes. In one study, researchers enrolled patients who were scheduled for reconstructive knee surgery. The doctors went through all the steps of the surgery in the operating room, including putting the patients under anesthesia and cutting open their knees. But instead of doing the surgery, they simply sutured them back up and monitored the results. And then compared to prior to surgery, what they found was these sham procedures helped patients feel less pain, use less morphine, had more mobility, and could climb more stairs and had reductions in objective amounts of swelling. Once again, showing the power of mindset in healing. We also know that more general mindsets about things like aging, diet, and exercise can be critical. An important experiment called the Counterclockwise Study, researchers out of Harvard University had a group of elderly men attend a week-long retreat where everything they saw was from 20 years earlier, including magazines, newspapers, television, and music. They were fed popular food from that era and instructed only to discuss personal and world events from that time 20 years prior. In other words, the context around them was arranged to put them into the mindset that they were young again. By the second day, everyone was actively involved in serving meals and cleaning up, even though two days prior they had needed help to carry their luggage around. After just one week living in this environment, the participants got noticeably younger on many of the experimental measures. Their hearing and their memory improved. They scored higher on intelligence tests. They had greater joint flexibility, grip strength, and manual dexterity. There were improvements on height, weight, gait, and posture. 
objective observers judged that photos of the subjects looked noticeably younger at the end of the study as compared to photos at the beginning. In a study that I led at Harvard, we worked with a group of hotel room attendants. Even though their jobs were very active, most of them did not perceive their work as exercise. In other words, they had the mindset that their work was work. They did not have the mindset that their work was good exercise. We took 84 room attendants working in seven different hotels and split them into two groups. We trained one group that their work was good exercise. We told them the amount of calories they were burning and the muscles they were using, and that they should receive the health benefits of all their activity. After just four weeks, this informed group reported experiencing significantly more exercise. Moreover, this now exercise savvy room attendants showed significant measurable reductions in weight, body fat, and blood pressure as compared to a group who didn't get the training. Importantly, the room attendants reported no change in their diet and no change in their exercise regimen, therefore demonstrating that significant changes in physiological health could be altered by a simple shift in mindset, from seeing their work as work to seeing it now as good exercise. In another mindset study, my colleagues and I brought volunteers to the metabolic lab at Yale University. The subjects believed the study was to taste milkshakes with different calorie contents. We hooked them up to an IV so that we could measure their physiological response to the shake. Specifically, we were interested in looking at their ghrelin levels. Ghrelin is a hormone that gets secreted in your gut in response to the food you consume. Your ghrelin levels drop in proportion to the amount of calories that you consume. So if you've had a rich, indulgent, high fat, high calorie meal, your ghrelin levels will drop at a steep rate, signaling to your brain that it can stop eating and that it feels full. On the other hand, if you just had a snack or a lighter meal with fewer calories and fewer nutrient contents, your ghrelin levels wouldn't change much at all, therefore signaling to your brain that it should continue to seek out food and that it's not completely satisfied. The first week, we gave the subjects the Sensa shake and showed them the label, which indicated that it had just 140 calories, zero grams of fat, and no added sugar. As expected, their ghrelin levels didn't drop much. The following week, they returned, and this time they were given the indulgent shake. This label indicated the shake contained 620 calories, 30 grams of fat, and 56 grams of sugar. This time, Subjects' ghrelin levels dropped significantly. The catch was that both weeks they were given exactly the same shake. And therefore, these changes in ghrelin levels, the steeper rate of drop in response to the indulgent shake, was due exclusively to their mindset about what they were drinking. The expectation of what the shake would do to their appetite significantly changed their physiological response to an identical milkshake. All of these studies suggest that the mindset you adopt in a given situation can produce physiological changes that are objectively measurable, whether it's placebo effects in drug trials, sham operations, fake poison IV and food labels, or simply being told that your work is exercise. Your mindset matters to your health, your performance, and your psychological growth. The purpose of this training is to help you use the power of your mindset to convert the stress you already have in your life to something beneficial for you. So, you might want to answer these two questions. What do you think your typical mindset about stress is? So do you approach whatever stress you are going through, being home or shelter in place or lockdown, whatever you call it, you know, working from home, studying from home. Do you think this stress, what you are going through right now, is it good for you? Or are you thinking every day, this stress is bad for me? How do you frame it? Whatever situation that you are going through right now, please write down uh, on a sheet of paper what is your typical mindset once you write that identify what is the most useful mindset to have at this time 
you know, in your family, you might have seen somebody else reacting to the same situation very differently. Or in your team, when you are on video conferences, you find somebody else is finding this to be very productive. What is it that uh, they are doing and what is the mindset that they are having that is helpful to them, but that is stressful to you? Like one of the things which I'm finding uh, in past three weeks or four weeks of staying home is that this is the first time in my life I am actually free in, you know, in my mind and I'm feeling happy to a certain extent, even though I'm not going out as much, even though I'm not doing a lot of different things that I was doing. I used to go play some table tennis. I used to go do some seminars. I used to attend, um, you know, yoga sessions. I used to go to gym. I used to meet friends. We used to go to a lot of different restaurants. All of them I cannot do. But what is amazing is I'm able to observe, you know, the flowers coming in and then essentially flowers going out and then uh, like small peaches, small size peaches appearing in the tree right beside my dining room window. I'm able to see, I know, like we have in the backyard a small Buddha and my wife has created a very nice uh, Zen garden just around it and she likes to go sit down there and meditate and she put some pinwheels and I watch those pinwheels turning in the wind and we see some squirrels coming in and out. We are seeing some uh, hummingbirds come in once in a while. So what is available to me all the time, I have lived in the same house for 33 years, except that I'm seeing the beauty of nature much, much more, you know, in a spacious, in a clear way than I have ever done before. And for the first time, I feel like my time has expanded. It feels like my experience of life has come to a place where I'm enjoying every moment. It's like suddenly I have become much more mindful, even though I teach this. Similarly, you might want to look at what are the things that you are experiencing now in this stressful time, instead of you know fear and anxiety, what are some small pleasures, small thank yous that you are grateful for? You might want to begin to start doing like a gratitude experiment. If you are not familiar with it, Google the word gratitude experiment and start doing every night like a write down three things that you are grateful for. Don't write generically, oh, my family, my job, or something like that. What about your family that you observed today that you are grateful for? What is it that your son or daughter or sibling or parents uh, uh, or your friends have done that you notice that brought that joy and a sense of gratitude today? So make it specific, concrete, granular uh, and event or experiment or experience that you are having and start writing it in a journal, like at least three things that are new and that is fresh that you are experiencing that brings you a sense of gratitude. Keep that gratitude journal during the entire time that you are staying home. And I believe that within like 21 days, like a three weeks to four weeks, you begin to notice more things to be grateful for than more things to be upsetful for. So the key is your attitude pretty much during this stressful time, trying time, can determine how you experience stress. If I go to the next slide, this is from a book by a physician called Alan Watkins in UK. He called this book coherence uh, it is about not just 
coherence in a mental professional uh, mental profession field but also this is useful for leaders if any of you are trying to do leadership development for yourself whether you are a student whether you are a parent if you want to become a better leader this book is highly recommended in this book uh, in this particular slide what you are seeing is essentially like uh, two things most of the time people felt managing stress is related to either activation or relaxation most people felt by doing exercise by going out by you know uh, relaxing by literally not worrying about stressful stuff but uh, dealing dealing with you know whatever relaxes you avoiding the stress not having whatever you don't have control give it up let it go and then focus on something else they thought in the y axis of activation and relaxation that the stress management is most effective but in recent studies as you just saw from stanford university and yale university this has been there in a variety of universities that they are discovering through their psychology departments and through physiology departments that stress can be managed a lot more effectively by looking at how we deal with the emotions so the negative emotions seem to put us into a catabolic state by generating cortisol whereas same thing if we can reframe the negative emotion as a positive emotion we go into anabolic state and we generate this youthful hormone called dhea like some of you if you are using biotin or some of the other things you know to make your skin uh, shine or become younger or any of them you are talking about dhea so essentially if you look at these hormones uh, in this particular one fight flight responses generate adrenaline noradrenaline and also cortisol whereas when you actually begin to feel positive it becomes very different so what it means is the situation that you are going through regarding your job regarding the uncertainty regarding trying to attend from tomorrow uh, you know like your family your cooking uh, your work your video conferences all the distractions all the disturbances that might be making you angry or frustrated or anxious or some level you have given up you know what my stock portfolio has reduced a lot my retirement uh, you know 401k uh, or even children's funds even my future investments all of them have tanked at least 20% it looks like uh, Uh, the rentals that i have are not going to pay back and i can't even let them go because they are not paying the rent so there are lots of negative things financially time management wise stress wise you know there is a lot of pressure you might be feeling and you might have given up on that and feel apathetic or inattentive and feeling detached and given up kind of a state you might be both of these which are on the right hand side of the slide do not generate your ability to manage stress effectively so the mindset that will help you a lot is if you can find in the middle of all this chaos in the middle of all this anxiety and depression and trying times if you can think of small thing to be passionate about like for example listening to old songs and finding an old song that really kind of got you into a high energy mood or feel enthusiastic about something like for example recently i started feeling enthusiastic about cooking which i never did uh, most of my life and uh, i started thinking about the foods that my grandparents made or my aunts made or my mother used to make when we were young and i started learning them from youtube and then making them up interestingly i have tried something called gur papdi which came out okay and uh, on the other side there was another kind of a uh, vada i made yesterday 
and that was uh, not close to disaster i tried to do baked uh, you know what you call black eye peas vada alathanda vada they call it but uh, you know it didn't work out as well and i tried to bake it and i kept going 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 but then till somebody pointed out i think it is my wife who pointed out saying that i looked at the recipe on the youtube because it is from india video when they said 220 degrees it is the 220 degrees centigrade whereas i am living in united states i put that for 220 degrees fahrenheit and nothing is cooking even after an hour once i changed it to 425 degrees it started making progress but by the time you know like uh, myself and my wife were so hungry we just dropped it right there in the oven and then we proceeded with whatever other things which we were eating but on reflection when i felt enthusiastic about cooking when i was motivated to do things which i normally don't do listen to some music do you know take some small walks with my wife i was really feeling that i'm getting to spend more time in a joyous situation with my family now rather than any time in the past so that sense of feeling receptive curious interested and then um, what you call uh, contented on the right side generates a positive emotion for me rather than dealing with the negative emotion what does it really mean to you if you are going through a lot of stress because of whatever you are going through you can do some things at a body level you can do some things like like a body level you can take walks you can do yoga you can do chair yoga if you want you can do small set of exercises like there are many gyms many kinds of fitness centers are doing video exercises for you you can actually look at them and you can do small stretches while you are doing or do surya namaskaras which doesn't require anything else and which will give you kind of a relaxation flexibility and resistance kind of exercises in addition to that control your breath because our emotions are connected lot more to how you breathe by learning certain kinds of uh, brahmari or uh, kapal bhati or simha kriya that, that recently uh, sadguru jatgi vasudev was talking about or some of you might have learned sudarshana kriya that uh, uh, sri sri had talked about or there may be like a baba ramdev's exercises you know you might want to learn to do certain things about pranayama and controlling your breath and that will get you from negative emotions negative stress at least into a neutral state if not already to a positive state once you go from a fight flight responses and you go from a negative you know stuck state to neutral state next step is identify things that you can be curious about you can be passionate about you can be enthusiastic about and what intrinsically motivates you what you know you follow your interest follow your passion and by doing it you can le- learn to control your emotion i remember when i was uh, young <clears throat> um, when my children were um, they were i think my daughter was about three or four and my son was little older we went to with another family camping we had gone camping we woke up early in the morning there was a small lake there i had gotten out and i have a photography bug so i went out early morning to take some photographs uh, of the nature and as i was serenely <clears throat> enjoying the early morning sunrise and nobody being there and uh, i was very peaceful i saw a bear immediately i got scared <clears throat> i left the tripod i left the camera and i was you know immediately turning around and trying to go hide when i saw it, my kid coming out of the tent 
and the my tent was unfortunately between me and the bear so if i go run away as i was planning going into the trees and somewhere else my kid could be exposed to the danger and instantaneously i found out that once i looked at my helpless child being in the path of danger immediately turned around my brain and suddenly uh, i thought about taking the uh, tripod and the camera and turning it around and using it as a big stick i started running towards the danger you know shouting at the top of my voice and interestingly whatever that bear or what whichever animal uh, that was there went away in the different direction what did i learn from that story and you might want to think about what do you take away when i am afraid when i am petrified when i cannot be anything beyond the fight and flight it's all about me but the moment some love and some care for somebody else when my love for my child came into my mind fear was no longer dominant that means if you can control your emotion if you can begin to think about love or positive emotion which are expressed by some of the things in this slide on the left hand side suddenly the terror the fear and fight flight responses moves away and then you can get into something very very different so there are lots of other videos and you can do more work on reframing stress by going to this uh, website you can go to the um, you know the website which i mentioned or you can even go to the google uh, docs uh, website which is listed here and then you can get the rethinking stress workbook and i highly recommend you do the exercise <clears throat> they have some kind of an assessment before you start doing the exercises take that and do these exercises over a period of 4 to 6 weeks period and then take the assessment again then you will actually know for yourself plus your data point will help stanford university for psychology department to see how their program is working as well if i were to summarize and i would say according to the indian philosophy if i were to bring from the latest medical stuff five areas in which stress shows up <clears throat> they are at the body level which is the physiological level as you know the rigidity stiffness stomach aches headaches all of this which you have which i have listed in the beginning of the slides um, beginning of the web webinar it can show up in your breath it can show up in your emotions it can show up in your feeling and thinking of course i just want to differentiate here feelings are different from emotions feelings are what you might call cognized emotions that means you may go through a certain emotion of fear or depression or anxiety but as i just showed it in the previous slide if you can reframe it if you can control your emotion and if you can bring love or if you can kind of think about the positive emotion just like the daughter who went to disneyland only felt joy of all these adventurous stressful rides whereas the mother was petrified because of her younger time experience of fear came up and she was not able to reframe that means when you reframe stress you will gain positivity and that is what is feeling feeling is either bare raw emotion and you are only thinking from fear that means it is going to have a negative effect or you can cognize it differently and that might create opening just like i did uh, in 1989 when i was let go of apple that i could reframe my um the situation as i learned so much i talked to so many wonderful people and now i have enough money to start my own research institute that's how my mithya institute for learning and knowledge um 
architecture got created and which is what i have been doing for past 30 years all out of that stress that is called cognitive reframing and finally it all comes down to what behaviors you do so if i were to put it in a simple way of uh, how to reduce stress number one changing the stressful situation itself but majority of the times like i would even say 90 percent of the times you don't have control on what creates stress for you but what you have control which is the 90 percent of what is in your uh, you know uh, hands is changing the perception and changing your capacity to deal with the situation either to increase the skills or reframing it in such a way you can do what are some things you can do at a physiological level there are variety of things which i have listed out here you know like yoga or taking walks with your friends or family or you know right now you can't go with your friends because of shelter in place and you cannot meet other people and social distance but you can take walks with your family nearby good sleep you know i'm used to normally believe that six hours of sleep is very good but these days i'm taking i'm having eight hours of sleep and i'm actually increasing seeing that the amount of good sleep has increased you know unfortunately i'm still a scientist so i keep looking at my apple watch and i keep looking at google fit and i keep looking at all kinds of things to look at quality of my sleep and i keep measuring various type of stuff but also because of this uh, uh, situation that i can't go out there is a structure there is a discipline i'm trying to eat by a certain time i'm trying to eat healthy food i'm trying to do various things in a certain time that has helped my health as well as increase my happiness similarly second layer is the breath you know variety of things based on your interest and passion you can go to yoga bharati site you can look at baba ramdev stuff you can do sri sri sudarsana kriya you can follow jaggi vasudev simha kriya i've given references to that and uh, you know ultimately it comes down to you need to own your stress nobody is creating the situation you are not a victim of somebody else including the victim of situation you have once you own your stress you become a leader in your own life and that self awareness and attention allows you to let go and accept whatever scenario you are facing whether it is job situation or anything else and finally you know what you call a um, cognitive behavior therapy reframing visualization is very useful and there is a something called building your emotional capital they use something called a hero acronym h is hope e is efficacy r is resilience o is optimism we know we will fail sometimes but can you be resilient to try it again and learn from the failure and finally uh, there are wonderful things from our indian background called yoga nidra you can go to bihar school of yoga you can go to other things to learn and finally there are some things like a ask why and find a way to do some things so there are variety of exercises that can be done i thought we might be able to do visualization but uh, some of the videos which i saw yesterday i felt those are more useful for you so at this moment i am ready to take some questions i had some questions like two three questions that have come in saying i am af afraid of so and so so and so i am terrified about situation that's going on in india i am terrified about people who are dying because united states has become number one in the world in terms of deaths as well as the largest number of cases and i'm worried about various things i can do it and i'm concerned about all the stuff and i'm afraid and this, you know another question somebody asked me was is this all about reframing isn't it a positive pollyanna you know i can't change anybody else with my positivity then how am i going to and change the mind of my boss to give me the job or to not to let me go again i think 
if you can focus on what you can do like somebody said what universe creates for you is called fate but what you do with what universe has created is changing the destiny so you can either call this as your karma or you can figure out what your dharma is that is probably the best way i can leave it and i'm open to taking any questions that you have for next 15 minutes or if you want to i'll be happy to stay more and i'll be happy to take questions as long as you want uh, thank you dr kaipa uh, it was really very interesting and informative and at least for me there are so many other concepts so it might take a couple of days for me to digest what you have told so far um thank you i have a few questions uh, people have asked uh, on the question line i will convey it to you you can uh, okay. um, give your response now couple of questions i already emailed to you i don't know whether you had a um, chance to talk about it but the question goes like this if one believes that the situation can be controlled till the pursuit of controlling brings immense stress how to yeah. deal with that when should we say it's good to give up or keep pursuing it isn't it excess helpful uh, hopefulness is leading the waste of time imagine a case of upsc or any other entrance exam preparation by students okay yeah you're right that uh, controlling the situation again is not in our hands if we get worked up about how do i control the situation that actually makes you really more frustrated and uh, puts you into a negative stress and that will make it much worse than necessary and the stress and the trauma and ptsd and anxiety and depression are many of them coming because it is not just about stress that is happening to you outside but you are ruminating about it you are actually making it your own like somebody said in these trying times don't let things to work on you you know like you might have heard of uh, um, a story from ramakrishna paramahamsa talks about two disciples walking down a path um, and uh, seeing <coughs> a young woman crying near a small uh, lake um, what she they found out that one one monk when he went and asked that this young woman has left the town and this particular lake which has swollen and which is blocking the road is making her unable to go back to her home to take care of her young kid so she is struggling and the water he the monk realized is actually more of a waist deep but it is not actually uh, a problem for him so he offered to carry her uh, and then put her on the other side he was strong enough to be able to carry her above the water level and safely he put her on the other side and then he continued uh, with the other monk the path that he was on uh, the other monk was extremely upset about what this particular monk has done they go to their monastery and uh, the second monk doesn't even talk to this monk and uh, the all night long the other monk was tossing and turning and the next morning before the meditation session he comes and bugs the first monk saying aren't you really ashamed of yourself you know we are told not to touch the woman not to think about women not to be so close that's why we took the monastery vows and, and now you went and you carried her and you went and talked to her even though she was not coming and talked to her that is something that uh, you have broken the vows of uh, monkhood and you need to go talk to the master and repent and the first monk laughed and basically said you know brother i left the lady on the side of the bank yesterday why are you carrying her still in your mind 
so the key is not that the situation you can change but your receptivity can change if you can change your way in which you are feeling it that will allow you to have different stress response and that is the entire uh, videos and various things that i have shown hope that is useful uh, to you and it addresses your question second question you had sir can you say it again i thought yeah. you addressed it. maybe you can say yeah it. yeah second question is uh, it'll be helpful if there are suggestions on how to deal with the night time anxiety mm -hmm. also about the trouble falling to sleep because of not wanting to lose the control okay Uh, the most powerful thing see insomnia not being able to fall asleep night terrors uh, bad dreams waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to go back to sleep or some of the specific things that uh, stress can create and majority of us will go through it some of the things which i found useful are again related to at the body level and the breath level and by the way some of you if you have done vipassana meditation or any other kinds of buddhist meditations you might know that they talk about what is called uh, watching the breath and watching the body sensations so if you are having difficulty to fall asleep because of all the things that are going on in your mind one thing which you may want to do is when you go to bed lie down in the bed and just observe your breath what does it mean notice whether you are breathing in from both nostrils when you are breathing in and by the way as i am talking you can experiment you know just observe you can even try to put your finger near your nose and see you know when i am breathing in am i breathing through both nostrils as i am breathing out as i am breathing through both nostrils if i am not forcefully breathing breathing in and not forcefully breathing out is it happening mostly through one mostly through bo both are they different and if you are observing this breath going in and going out now as you are looking at it did the mind bother you did whatever situation you are not in control did it come to your mind no because as soon as you are focusing on something that is very present in your consciousness right now like breath or like physical sensations the emotion or whatever is the situation that you are not able to control does not bother you anymore that means if you can look at the place between your lips and the nose and try to see whether you have any sensation of air going in or when you breathe out can you feel the sensation of the air at this point and similarly if you can actually pay attention to as you breathe in slowly and steadily can you see your stomach and abdomen going out actually for some of you you might notice as you breathe in sometimes the abdomen comes out to a certain point and it may go back it might surprise you that as you are filling your lungs your abdomen is actually going back and so observe some of these kinds of patterns or you you know you can put your hand on the stomach as you breathe in is it going up as you breathe out is it going down so while you are lying in the bed pay attention to your breath pay attention to your stomach pay attention to which nostril it is which nostril it is not and continue to pay attention to even counting the number of breaths before you fall asleep these simple techniques are very useful for you to take your mind off whatever is bothering you whatever is unable to let go of its grip on your emotional state can slowly and steadily come out so that is one Um, exercise that i have done it and i have recommended it to a large number of people um, different techniques of breathing and uh, working with it it works by the way this comes from the hindu roots it talks about panchakoshas you know body uh, is the first layer second is pranamaya kosha 
the third layer is the manomaya kosha which is the lower mind in the western language in the english language we only call mind whereas in sanskrit we talk about manas buddhi chitta and ahankara like this these are all different states of mind so the third is that fourth is vijnanamaya kosha how do we make decisions that is the next one you may have control on some things you may not have control on some other things but with whatever you have control of make the decisions with that and then finally it talks about anandamaya kosha that is ultimately when you are happy when you are able to find joy from the sense of happiness from the sense of gratitude from the sense of appreciation you will learn that what you appreciate appreciates so focus on things that you are joyful about happy about and compare with people who don't even have that food they have freedom to go out and buy vegetables and groceries in united states that in india they can do it you can walk in your neighborhoods in united states in india police will beat up if you go at the end of the corner if you can begin to think about the freedom that you have choice that you have control that you have on things that you are joyful about you will find out that it is easier to be much happier rather than be upset about what you don't have control i hope that answers your question and uh, thank you and then the next one is uh, eu stress is enhancing and yeah. distress is debilitating and paralyzing yeah does this mean that identifying eu stress and the distress will help us in prioritizing what battles to pick in life the key is recognizing whatever situations that you have in life either you frame them as battles or you frame them as opportunities if you take the negative situation and frame them as an opportunity you generate you stress if you frame them as negative and if it is something that is distressing then obviously you experience distress i gave you the example of the mother who went with the young girl 8 year old young girl to disneyland they both went through exactly same circumstances but mother was distressed at a subconscious level that led to her immunity dropping by 40% whereas the child expressed it as a joyful situation so she felt you uh, eustress and her immunity went up so the key is between eustress and distress it is about the choices that you make that is why it is called the mindset and by the way for uh, mindset to learn some more there is an excellent book called mindset by carol dweck some of you who were on the strategy discussion you might have heard of even arvind bambri talked about the idea of fixed mindset versus growth mindset especially if you are looking at uh, developing yourself whether you are a young person or you are an adult i recommend that book very very highly uh, the look at and find whether you have a fixed mindset about things that will lead to distress and stress management is much harder for you and if you develop what is called a learning mindset which is a growth mindset then you will look at everything as an opportunity and some of you might even want to look at viktor frankl a gentleman who went through a nazi death camps concentration camps and at the end of that uh, i mean while he is in the death camp he was a physician and a psychologist he was asked to cure the patients so that they can be put to more work so till their death they were asked to contribute for the concentration camps so he was feeling very distressed saying i am a famous psychologist but here i am you know trying to work with the in a concentration camp prisoners to help them get better so that they can die in the hands of camp guards what a miserable situation i am in but somewhere in that path he realized you know my research is about what is called a logotherapy my research is on cognition how people feel it and being able to change the mind 
So why not I try to see whether I can help people to think of positive things while you are going through the concentration camp. If I can think about and uh, if I can reframe my situation and create a gap between what is the cause of my problem versus the cause of my happiness. If I can make a space between what is hitting me, how I'm responding to that stress, situation may change. He created that gap and he came up with this logotherapy that is one of the top, uh, you know, especially for CBT and some of them, they refer to it quite a bit. And if I remember right, he even got a Nobel Prize. I'm not too sure about it, but his book called uh, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, it is one of the books which is uh, offered, like I think it sold over several million copies. You may be able to even download it. I highly recommend that Man's Search for Meaning. It's a small 40 page, 50 page book, but it has been most influential book in my life by Viktor Frankl, F-R-A-N-K-L. Hope that answers your question. The next one is how to help middle school kids to manage stress. For example, okay. what kind of protein at home will help them during the situation? And uh, another one is, uh, do you have any tips or techniques for students appearing on a competitive exam? Okay, let me take the first question. The middle school kids, um, at when you are at that level, like a you know 10, 12, you know, what, 15 age, you are going through a lot of hormonal changes in the body. There is a lot of energy. There is a lot of curiosity. There is a lot of excitement. When you have them, I think the boredom is one of the biggest problems that they face. And also a certain sense that they're controlled, they're constricted in a place. So uh, I found out that I know, um, you know, like for example, phones, Androids and iPhones and many of them are available. I, I think a couple of days ago, Apple released the activity kit, like a games and other activity kits for young people on iPhone. If uh, you guys have no access to it, I'll be happy to send that to you. But you may be able to look for activity kit. Just two, three days ago, it was released. Similarly, there are a variety of things that you can use the iPads and uh, you know, Google, Androids, and PCs to be able to do. The key is identify family activities which may be of interest to them. Another way to say it is when the family gets together for dinner or a before dinner activity, make them in charge, make them the leader of coming up with an activity and controlling the game. They dictating how it is measured and you all follow them. Because most of the time, we try to control them, we try to guide them, giving a chance for them to control us and them to guide us might actually become a very favorite activity for them. So some part of your day, tell them you are the boss, everybody in the family will listen to you. And uh, of course, then your turn will reduce, other person will take over and then you have to listen to what they tell you to take, you know, do. So that way, different people, mom, dad, son, daughter, at different times, try to get everybody to do the activities they want to do, participate in what they want to play. Some of these might be ways in which you can reduce the stress in dealing with the middle school children. Now, the second question, can you say it again, please? Um, I think it's something to do with exam. Do you have any tips or techniques for students appearing in the competitive exam? Stressful yeah. time. Uh, yeah, definitely. In the competitive, when you are preparing for competitive exams, you know, I had done this seminar before. Uh, let me, I'll try to, you know, bring that uh, back to you or uh, might be able to provide that. There are series of exercises. There are specific kinds of yoga exercises that are uh, useful also. Yoga asanas, some of them, which are very good. Second, the first thing I would say to you is, number one, make sure you get 
timely food do not shrimp on food but at the same time don't take too many carbs too many type of things but try to eat in a mindful way um, whatever you are eating and make sure you eat things like uh, okra and things like blueberries and you know all the various stuff people say that will help you at some level with your memory at some level your own attention and your own ability to do how much they work for you it depends but at the same time make sure you are getting good timely food healthy food and don't uh, forget about that second thing is the amount of sleep reframe it as not like a wasting of time i should have less amount of sleep stay up longer cram a little bit more you know like uh, learn read a little bit more work a little bit harder that's all useful for input but if you recognize competitive exams is not how much you read but how much you remember at the time when you read the question and how quickly can you answer so that means it is not about the input of how much you put into your system but it is about output in a timely in an appropriate way what you can remember so from that perspective sleep is extremely useful if you can reframe sleep as a way to process the information that i have learned before sleep and i am you know like if you can even drink a half a glass of water put it right next to your bed stand on the bed stand and tell yourself you know i have read all this in my dreams in my sleep i will actually get some clarity on some of the things i am having difficulty and also some you know how all of these fall together i will get a big picture of uh, what i have understood what i have said and then put a paper and a pen right next to you in the bed, on the bed stand and then when you wake up in the morning before you run to the bathroom before you move before you make up your bed stay in the bed <clears throat> for an extra minute or two and ask yourself what dreams did i get what clarity did i get and if you need to remember just extend your hand to the bed stand take the half water that you have left behind in the glass drink the water and say now that you know i'm drinking the same water that i left behind while i was thinking about the questions i will remember the answers so some of these auto suggestions several times work pe for people to remember the dreams a little bit more vividly and before you run again to the bathroom when you are remembering those dreams even though you think those are so clear i will remember the entire day it won't happen take the paper and a pencil that you put on the bed stand and write down whatever you remember whatever you need to pay attention to at that time and then go go about doing it so this is like food exercise good good amount of sleep reframing sleep as a way to uh, organize your uh, thinking and then tell yourself do affirmations while people think affirmations are uh, just some you know uh, world made tales actually the psychology has proven there are several phd dissertations that i have read while i was teaching in saybrook uh, university uh, you know there was a person whom i came across called jerry jampolski who looked at attitudinal healing and there was another person david thornberg who was a educational psychologist all of them believed in what they call power thoughts what they are calling power thoughts are like on your mirror when you are preparing for competitive exams put down like a small statements like i am you know what you call very good in remembering things uh or i am you know excellent in taking exams or some such statements which are affirmations if you can write things in an affirmative way by the way do not write double negatives i will not forget during the exam is not a good statement to make because the mind looks at both negative and positive 
it treats in the same way so focus on positive affirmations and put you know put in different places like on your computer screen you know in your uh, you try to put your desktop some two three affirmations uh, about your uh, exam or about yourself wherever you have self esteem issues self confidence issues identify uh, some positive way of reframing it get some help from parents or other people and put them in various places so that you can see them it is not for your conscious mind it looks stupid to the conscious mind to put these things out but unfortunately or fortunately 90% of our mind and our performance is dependent on the subconscious and unconscious minds by the way i talked about five layers in my presentation other than thinking and other than behavior feelings emotions uh, what you call body sensations which are at a physiological level all of these uh, and the breath all of these are subconscious and unconscious uh, part of the mind so you, your body sensations your positive attitudes affirmations they all work on your emotions because energy emotion you can reframe it as energy in motion if you can create positive energy and uh, motivation and curiosity and interest in you that will work at a emotional level to help you to come up with right thoughts and right memories and right remembrances and it will increase your performance hope this is helpful to you in your exams yes yeah it's really elaborate and uh, before i go to the next one and uh, some of the books you mentioned and recommended uh, for the mindset you have it in your uh, um, presentation yeah, deck yeah so when we send the presentation deck to the uh, the participants the attendees or the registered ones they can see all those things there you we don't have to repeat that here right uh, i hope so some of them i you know in the reference list which i gave you i might not have i hope you recorded the presentation as i requested so that Uh, people can see it and then they may be able to remember and note it down because i remember and, uh, uh, and i think by talked about mindset by carol dweck is a book i mentioned and i'm trying to remember uh, i think oh. victor frankel's um, book i think it is called man search for meaning i referred to i don't remember what other books i referred to in the last part of it right now in q and a uh, i have not but other things i have put i think in the references but if you can add them to your deck and then send it to me then that will be better too because sure. some of them will really get it some of them wanted to text <laughs> and chat yeah. and put it in the chat line um but i think uh, like you said you know going through the recorded version will be lot more helpful than that Sure. Um, the next question we are talking, uh, continuing to talk about the kids. Um, how to stop showing our stress on kids, especially in these times when parents are working from home and spending uh, time, quality time. Yeah, excellent question. It is very, very important. That is where it is coming down to three parts which we talked about. One is. changing the stressful situation you cannot deal with it second one is changing our perception of the stress that is what is called the mindset third one is how to change our capacity to deal with the situation that is improving skills the skills that we need to improve on most is not to show you know what you call not to pass on the stress that we are feeling by shouting at children by you know snapping at them and uh, dealing with it so obviously you may be in overwhelm you may be in a, uh, you, you know like um, food is going on somebody is uh, doing something in the microwave your office is not too far you can hear the noises from the television noises from the kitchen and you are on a important uh, teleconference or a video conference with your boss or with your customers for perhaps and uh, this all becomes very very difficult to manage 
at that time we generally mute and then turn towards the kitchen and stop and the people and shout at people to say hey i am in a meeting shut up or something <coughs> that kind of behavior will have a lot more longer lasting implications in your family than your workplace what i suggest is <clears throat> recognize like a victor frankel example i just mentioned what comes to you if you can find a way to be the gap in which all that gets processed and what comes out of you is different if you can think about the slide that i showed you regarding the right hand side and left hand side i try to talk about anxiety and you know what you call people feeling various kinds of stress you know anxiety frustrated uh, anger apathy apathy inattentiveness detachment all of that are on the right hand side of it negative emotions that is what is coming to you in between okay let me show you the screen for a moment uh, so that way uh, it becomes easier can you see on the screen a particular slide that i talk in i'm talking about uh, here on the right hand side in the purple i talk about control your breath why is that you need to control your breath the input is coming to you from right to left whatever stress that you are feeling whatever overwhelm that you are feeling with your work and home and kitchen and kids all that situation might be generating all these uh, negative emotions that you see in blue on the right hand side the key is if you can at that time take a moment to count up to 10 or 3 or whatever and then control your breath because the breath that comes out of frustration is going to immediately generate negative memories and immediately allow you to shout or do something that you will regret later and that the line that you have in the middle activation relaxation think about that as you changing your mindset so once you change your breath take a deep breath and then just drink a glass of water and don't say anything even though you are very stressed take a minute to calm yourself down that is why you control your emotion and uh, don't react but respond or even create it's like somebody said to me reaction and creation are the same exact letters just one letter c moving from the middle to the front turns reaction into creation so same thing focus on what you want to create in the child or in the family rather than what you want them to react to if you can focus on the impact that you are going to have on them and the impact that you want to create with that end in mind try to be focused on what is enthusiastic for you what is motivating you and uh, you know what makes you curious or interested in what they are doing start from there and then deal with it so three steps if i were to summarize number 1 take a breath give a pause or count up to 10 somewhere do not re react to whatever is bugging you that's the first step second once you take a breath once you calm yourself down um, recognize and just focus on if you want visualize what impact you want to have out of your statement out of your action on other people whether it is your kid or whether it is your family just look at it and say if you shout at them what will be the what will be the impact on them or if you were to say it patiently if you were to reframe it if you were to focus on what they are interested in what stress they are going through and what they must be feeling if you can visualize that then chances are you can control your emotion a little bit more easily so first stop and breathe second 
stop and think of the end state impact third then in a positive way start with where they are and what they are going through and then express it in the context and in the emotional state that you have identified as the best way to bring positive response from them and help them to understand and help them to appreciate and understand what you are going through so that they will create a better environment for you so those are you know one two three steps but you know in the beginning it looks like it is too long and we can't do it if we can remember then we are following what victor frankel said because logo therapy means logo means the word therapy means using the words to make the situation heal itself rather than using the words to actually make the situation worse if we are on autopilot we automatically do pass the stress and make the situation worse but this is a learned behavior and this learned behavior is something that we can very easily practice but we need to practice it like probably 10 to 15 20 times and then be mindful every single time when we are uh, saying it by visualizing by shouting at them i'll create a negative impact but if i want to create a positive impact what do i need to say if you can keep mindful awareness of that impact then over a period of time your behavior will change and the stress on your children will be much less and you will also be patting yourself on the back that you have become a better parent than before thank you and uh, the next one one um, attendee has asked that when i am thinking about the time of my peak performance this performance yeah. i recall a lot of stress generated from not favorable circumstances mm -hmm. and that brings me bad memories and i dislike the reason um i had to work that this thing so how do i deal with that yeah i think uh, one movie which i had watched which i had not put in the references you might want to check that out now i think it is available it's called what the bleep you know like a something which we can't say in public what the uh, do you know it's a phenomenal movie it's a documentary movie which came out maybe 10 15 years ago what the bleep uh, movie if you check it out and uh, there are some very nice things that may be a worthwhile uh, movie to watch and do sometimes i use movies like that to do some seminars in the I know in a real face-to-face -face type of things i don't know how to do them on webinar but you might want to check it out okay what is the result and what do i want to say about that because you can't see the entire two hour movie right now one is remember that what you have right now is a feeling of all the negative things that could happen just like you can visualize positive outcomes and positive impact our mind continually visualizes negative impact and negative things that have happened in the past unless you create positive memories consciously with awareness and mindfulness right now and every single time your past negative memories will continue to impact you all the time that is the way mind is built mind or the brain are essentially there to prevent negative stuff to happen to you like death or uh, fight and flight responses are some things that the patterns of the brain are very good at recognizing and coming back that's what if you talk about the three levels of the brain like uh, you know long time ago 50 years or more paul mclean talked about the brain having three layers <clears throat> the reptilian brain which comes from 50000 years the second one is the um, um, mammalian brain which is the emotional brain or limbic brain the third is the cognitive brain it's called neocortex whenever we are stressful whenever we are thinking of all these 
negative things, we go back into fight flight responses. That means we go back into reptilian mode. That means we have very limited choices at that time. We don't even, I mean, actually, probably the physicians in the group can explain it a lot better. Maybe if Balu were to say it, he would say it differently, uh, that the stress allows us to bring our brain into the lowest functional state. Sometimes people say when we are so stressed, um, we our eyes can't even see color. Like think, think of a time when you have to run to the airport and you don't know where the keys are. You keep looking at the same place again and again and again, as if magically the keys will appear, even though you check them two minutes before. But the brain can't think of anything else because this is where I kept the keys last time. But that is not where you will find the keys. When you can upshift your brain, when you can consciously let go and take a breath, just like I told you in the previous question, stop take a breath, consciously change your emotional state by thinking of the impact that you want to have and then you know, relax a little bit, come back into the present moment instead of your projection of negativity from the past into the future, come back to the present moment where none of that has happened, then you can do it. There is an excellent uh, TED talk uh, a guy called Ferris, I think I forgot his name. Mm, I think uh, just Google fear casting, Ferris TED Talk fear casting. If you Google it, you will be able to find uh, some uh, very interesting thing by a stoic approach to uh, looking at things where imagining all the stuff that is happening uh, negatively. Uh, yeah, Tim Ferriss is the name of the guy. Uh, Tim Ferriss, uh, fear casting, he says, imagine all the negative things that could happen and write them down. And then imagine all the positive things that could happen if you do it, even though you are so afraid. And then if uh, you can see positive impact coming out of the future, even if the chances are you know, more than what was before, just do it. But make sure you mitigate all the negative things that could go wrong. Make some actions to mitigate. Like if you are afraid of the plane, planes might collapse or you might get, uh, you know, COVID-19 virus by getting on a plane. You are told to go on a plane right now. Think about what are all the positive things that could happen. Take the sanitizer, get, you know, if you want to wear a gown or a, not just a mask, wear a complete gown, sit on the plane with the gown, and when you get out of the plane, change the gown completely. And so, you know, take all the precautions that mitigate all the negative things which you are imagining, but go ahead and do it anyway. Like somebody said, fear doesn't disappear by running away from it. Fear is acknowledging it, embracing all the things and trying to find a way to mitigate it and then move through the fear. By the way, entrepreneurship is all about that. If you have done any entrepreneurship, you notice that other people may be afraid to take the risk and uh, create the products or create a company, but entrepreneurs on a day-to-day -day basis, they deal with the stress of looking at their you know, organization collapsing, especially knowing that probably 90% of the entrepreneurial startups never see the end of even one year or two years. Even though you know that, you know how to mitigate the risk. That's what gives you the courage to start another startup, another startup. So the key is to remember, mind automatically gives you negative impact, but you have to consciously with full awareness you have to develop positive scenarios. Stress management is about creating positive scenarios by reframing your mind so that you can bring big transformational changes in your life out of this rather than small incremental past continuing to repeat itself in your future. Okay. I'll be happy to answer. Uh, 
Now the question is, is it better to get away from a situation where you might be fired, which is stressing you too much, or yeah. it's better to fight? For example, you have put in so much effort in your work. Yeah. But, uh, the feedback you get from the boss is, uh, is not very positive. So mm -hmm. what do I, you know, fight, now I fight that life kind of thing. Okay. There are two things in that type of situation. One is, if there is something unfair, if there is something illegal, and if there is a certain... Um, what you might call a negativity that uh, probably the you let us say your manager is firing you in an inappropriate way for inappropriate thing and you think that that might even affect other people then it may be worth fighting if it is about your perspective versus your manager's perspective or your company's perspective doesn't matter what you do, they are not going to change the outcome and uh, they have already determined and this is the way it is going to go and you don't have any legal basis for it and you don't have any specific uh, stuff other than a satisfaction that I was able to you know, get back or I was able to argue properly, then it is better to walk away. Don't waste your energy in those kinds of situations. So the key is, First of all, is your perspective about the right reason to be fired or ineffectiveness or whatever that you think, you are probably not the best judge of it. And your family may not also be the best judge of it. But you may want to figure out how to gain a third person perspective in that scenario. How do, so one you, most useful thing I think about is if uh, you know this is called a role play it's an exercise you can do it with a good friend who doesn't have any fear in telling you the truth or to tell you that you are a fool or tell you that you are wrong a person it can be your spouse it can be your friend pick that person and ask them to be the manager and then you tell all the things that you want to you know tell your case as if the other person is your manager. Ask them to listen to you and then ask them to share what they experience uh, and what they feel and uh, what they see as legitimate case of yours or emotional case of yours or maybe you are creating this case out of just frustration. There may not be any legitimacy to the case that you are presenting. So like that, get a perspective from somebody. And then, by the way, take their case. Take uh, You become the manager and let them be you and let them make the case. And now you take the perspective of your manager or your company and try to justify why that uh, your firing is legitimate and what are all the positive things what are all the possible things that they know about you especially because you are playing the role of your manager you know your weaknesses as well as your strengths so from as a manager what would you say to yourself so do that that is what is called sakshi bhavana in sanskrit in philosophy but this is about developing the third person perspective this is what is also called gaining role clarity you may be, you know, as an employee, you may be really ticked off, but as a manager, that might be the exact legitimate thing to do. Or if they don't fire you, they may have to fire somebody else who is even much better. So it is the question of firing between good and the better. So good is gone. Doesn't mean you are bad. It just means that they don't have an opportunity to pay both of you so they picked one so you may have to justify it that way and let go but whatever you do remember that if you don't talk it out if you don't get this out of your system and don't find a way to change your mindset about firing or letting go and moving on uh, it will bug bug you a lot it will create a lot of negative emotions in your body if you remember my own let go from Apple 
where one day I was a fellow reporting to topmost people in the organization where I'm being told that I'm creating the future of Apple and there are only four or five people like me in the company uh, with the total freedom and next day I'm let go. So you can imagine how I must have felt. But when I reframed it, I didn't look at it like they were firing me. I felt like they gave me a freedom to create life as my own. And that reframing created my 30 years of career. And if I were to say right now, what is one of the best transformative moments in my life, I feel getting fired or getting let, or let go from Apple was the probably the turning point in my life that made me go into my own self-awareness and become a better person. Thank you, Dr. Kaipa. The, the next one it says is uh, recently took a new opportunity and need to focus on new job and have to learn a lot. Yeah. At the same time, I had to do the fam balance with the family, cooking and uh, mm. uh, not worrying about enjoyment and managing both without getting angry and frustration. Yeah. Particularly for women, they are more prone to this increased stress due to balancing work, home, and kids. Yeah. So, this is something, as you rightly say, uh, it is extremely important. You know, like uh, um, for women, they, they, they do 7 by 24 by 365 rest of their life. They don't have vacation. If they are working, uh, they are at least they have a eight hour job. But if they come home, they have a 24 by 7 by 365 job. And yes, in United States, uh, the husbands do help. I'm assuming that more, more of you do. And uh, you may share a lot more, but it is frustrating because ultimately accountability and responsibility sometimes is left to the mother or left to the spouse, uh, you know, the wife. So I can empathize with you and uh, uh, appreciate your situation that you may be in a much more stressful scenario. The key I found is two things. One is either you look at it and say you are the master of your life and your universe or you are the victim of this universe or victim of the male universe or victim of the whatever you want to call. Choice is ultimately yours. You have to, you know, you are not going to be able to run away from either the family or a new job and new excitement and new opportunities. If you are able to let go one or the other, then this question doesn't arise. But if you can't, then the key part is you might as well figure out what are all the priorities. You know, the prioritization is extremely important in stress management. Don't look at prioritization for the whole month or whole week or for your job versus family. Don't look at it like, of course, my children are the most important. Now, those are what you might call 30,000 feet uh, kinds of priorities. I want you to get to today's priorities. So when you wake up today, you say, I have a 10 o'clock meeting with my manager and uh, the skip level manager that is very important, 9 to 10 or 10 to 11, 11 to 12, I'm going to be really busy, 9 to 10 for preparation, 10 to 11 for the meeting, and then 11 to 12 to write down and to prepare what I need to do. So please, how do I ask my spouse? How do I ask my kids to collaborate? Can my spouse uh, take some time and put them in, you know, in another room? Or can I... I know I hate uh, using TV as a babysitter, but for these two hours, can I use TV, put on a nice show which they like to watch or play some games? Can I leave them and uh, close the doors and so I can engage with it? But once they gave me the time, then I'm going to prioritize for next two hours, X, Y, and Z that I need to deal with my family, what I need to deal with. And then another thing which is most important in these times when everybody is cooped up and locked up in their house for their work and fun and children and everything, it is about uh, sharing responsibilities and kind of delegating various tasks. 
your kids might not be the best ones to organize a menu or to cook or some of the things but maybe you and kids and spouse can organize in such a way you make them the chef for the day and come up with the menu in with their uh, collaboration the kind of things that they can put together whether it is salads whether it is soups whether it is the chocolate cakes make them the in charge of kitchen make them in charge of lunch or dinner or something else and then stop worrying about it it's okay if they only you only eat desserts for your entire meal for one meal it doesn't matter but at least the responsibility of the meal for that day is taken care of and it is off your hands so like that if you can delegate and work with other people in the family to do what they can and uh, enjoy it and then it will give you freedom to do what you need to and not get stressed out about it this is the hardest part how to trust your family members we say we love them so much but are we how committed are we to trust and delegate and work with them and slowly develop them to take more accountability and responsibility while you learn to become more of a manager of the family rather than bottom line responsibility lies with me and i am going to get stressed out if anything goes wrong either at work or at home or health or children or anything else so that is again a mindset change i hope uh, i am explaining it in a way that it is meaningful to you so first and foremost is for you to become the master of your universe rather than the victim of your universe and this begins with you internally and then through delegation through conversations and communication you can structure your universe over a period of time into empowering you so that you can empower them thank you the next one is um i joined a new job um uh, mm -hmm. it's a startup and uh, my manager from the old job which is a big company wants me to rejoin i'm really stressed what to do two things you have a new opportunity and you have an old opportunity now you may want to do what is called a sometimes uh, there are exercises which are very powerful this is called polarity management uh, there is a simple you know you can google polarity ex, uh, polarity management and barry barry i'll try to remember his uh, last name but he will kill me he is a good friend so if i don't remember his last name but unfortunately i don't at this moment so um, i will look that up but uh, just google polarity management and uh, uh, just put yeah barry johnson yeah polarity management barry johnson there may be some web there may be some simple exercises there may be a powerpoint or there may be a talk that either berry or some of his friends might have given which helps you to look at two different circumstances how to see which is the better decision to make so for example start up on one side your large company your manager asking you to take your job they are giving you some promotion or they are giving you some raise or they are asking you to do two things there one going back to old job uh, with your old manager number 1 um, you probably know the work very well 80% 90% of what you do day after day after day you probably are under it is under control uh, so there will be less stress in terms of doing the job and uh, also they are giving you a little bit more money or whatever new responsibilities that may be a good place to be in and the people whom you work with are also people whom you know so you don't have to have stress of learning about new people and making new friendships that is on one side that is a, what is called the upside of staying in the current job upside of the new job is obviously the excitement of learning something new developing new skills adding a couple of new items in your resume for the future uh, you know 
is something that is uh, something the new startup offers. Second thing is there may be a big upside if the startup becomes spectacularly successful, you may be able to make 10 times the money that your current large company can offer. Third thing could be that you could learn new set of skills that you always wanted to learn may not be for money, may not be for career, but it may be good for you personally because you are excited about that new technology or new opportunity uh, or new you know, area. So those are some other positives, but uh, upsides on taking the job. Similarly, write down all the negatives of the current scenario. That what are the downsides of staying with the current job? The same problems that made you feel like you need to run away from that company, they're going to not change and they will be there right in front of you. Number two, you know, what you call, they may offer some more money and some more stuff, but also they are going to expect a lot more out of you and they are keeping you not because of you, but because the customer wanted or a project will not get done without you. So in some respects, the situation that made you want to change the job hasn't changed and they will bug you even more because you had an opportunity to get out. Every time something negative happens in the current job and current company, you will always have a regret that you didn't take an opportunity to get out. So like that, you may write down some of the downsides of being in the job. And then similarly, you write down what are the downsides that will be in taking a new job. Uh, you know, downside might be, you know, that might be farther from home or it might require more travel or it requires a lot of new learning and you might have to learn some new language if you are in IT or, or you may have to learn new instrument if you are in some experimental stuff or in manufacturing. So there are variety of upsides and downsides to both scenarios. So my recommendation is take a sheet of paper, create like on a left hand side, uh, you know, uh, write down about current job, right hand side, write down about a new job. And uh, then uh, in on uh, the same sheet, bottom half, draw a line and say on the top, I have upside, bottom side, I have downside. On the right hand side, I have the new opportunity upside. On the down right hand side, I have the this one. Use different pens. I ask you to bring anyway eight and a half by paper and uh, the color pens. Before we fin I mean, before we get out, before you get out of this particular uh, webinar mood, take the time right now to write down upside and downside of all of it. And you even ask your spouse to elaborate on the upside and downside and for, for both of them. And once you do all of them, put some emotional factors into that as well. What are the emotional things that will make you feel good or that makes you feel bad? in both of them and then uh, ask your spouse how they will choose and then come back no matter what your spouse said see what will make you happy and make a choice so this will make your subconscious assumptions subconscious fears come to the surface and then making a decision you are at least you are not going into it blindly you are going with your eyes open so even if some stress comes out of it, you can handle it a lot better. Thank you, Dr. Taipa. This is the last one I'm going to ask you. Mm. Uh, with respect to entrepreneurship, how to mm. combat embarrassment? Okay. I had a good friend uh, called Doug Ingelbart. Some of you in IT industry, you might have heard of Doug Ingelbart as the founder or as the creator of Computer Mouse. He's the guy who invented them when he was in uh, SRI, Stanford Research Institute, long time ago. Or, no, no, maybe he was in McDonnell Douglas at that time. One of the things he used to tell me, I had an opportunity to coach him um, in the later years of his life. Uh, he was the guy who was like a national technology medal winner, remarkable genius who has so many inventions, uh, who they are yet to find uh, that light of the day and uh, he was one thing i asked him when i asked him how did you invent so many how come you have so many patents how come you invented all this type of stuff 
uh, when you were uh, in the same situation when everybody else felt stressful he said to me prasad i'm never embarrassed i said what do you mean by that the amount of learning you do is directly proportional to the um amount of embarrassment you face he said i said what do you mean by that he said look whatever embarrasses you is coming from your fixed mindset oh i should have known that i should have known better gee that was stupid that is terrible i didn't forget i poured soup on my brand new shirt or i spilled water on my boss's pants all of these are embarrassing situations but you know what you can't retrieve them you can't go back to them why not accept that embarrassment and number 1 accept it or number 2 expect it when you take on a new task when you do a new job when you learn something new embarrassment is the least problem because sometimes some jobs kill you literally and some jobs demote you because you are unable to handle the stress or the skill level that is required in it if only thing that you have to worry about is embarrassment wow you are really lucky if you think that way and be willing to look like a fool look like stupid person and uh, do what you need to do then you will take your job lightly It's one of the biggest complaints about me uh, you know my family had made and some of my best friends had made is i'm too intense i get into it a lot and i don't separate out my work and my family and uh, i don't know how to take things lightly sometimes i think once i learned from uh, um, doug ingelbart about embarrassment i began to realize acknowledging where i'm stupid where i am embarrassed where i don't know which i should have known all of that is actually helping me to listen better and uh, be more open and be more honest and develop trust with my colleagues a lot more easily so i recommend that you look at the embarrassment as an opportunity to learn deeply and uh, and actually go places where you will not go if you were not to feel embarrassed about it thank, thank you, you very much yeah thank you i enjoyed it and i think the questions you know like this is like a two and a half hours it is supposed to be a one and a half right. hour session so we had one hour 15 minutes of questions and answers that shows me that you are really interested in this topic or you are engaged in this i appreciate it very much and uh, look forward to um again more sessions in the future thank you